Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're answering one of the most common questions we get asked here at the museum. Was USS New Jersey nuclear armed? Uh, the short answer to that is possibly. The whole reason for reactivating the Iowa-class battleships in the 1980s was to equip them with the armored box launchers for Tomahawk cruise missiles. This was a new weapon system that the Navy had just developed. Uh, however, it was going to take years to design ships able to accommodate this weapon system. So they look at uh, what ships are in reserve that have the largest reserve of buoyancy uh, that are therefore able to accommodate a lot of these missiles. And they choose the Iowa-class battleships. And reactivating these ships cost about $330 million a piece, or not adjusted for inflation, three times the initial cost of building the ship, but only the cost of a modern 1980s frigate. So it was a relatively low cost to, within a year, and you know the Navy can't build anything within a year these days, uh, to get this weapon system to sea. The Tomahawk cruise missile is actually a family of missiles, which back in the 80s at least, came in three different variants. TASM, the Tomahawk Sea Attack Missile, which had a significantly longer range than the Harpoon, to be able to compete with late Soviet-era anti-ship missiles. TLAM-C, or the Tomahawk Land Attack Missile Conventional, which is probably what the majority of the Iowa-class battleships missiles were, and it's the only of these three variants that has survived to the modern day, and it's still in use with the modern Navy. But that is the one that, uh, if we are doing a modern shore bombardment mission and firing missiles into uh, enemy territory from a ship, such as what happened in Syria years ago, that's the one we're using. And TLAM-N, or Tomahawk Land Attack Missile, nuclear. So, there was a nuclear type of tomahawk, which may have been carried by Iowa-class battleships at various times in the 80s. Now, depending on which crew members we talk to uh, from which commissioning of the ship, uh, they'll say that, no, 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 the ship only had uh, conventional land attack tomahawk cruise missiles, or it had a mix of TASM and TLAM, uh, sea attack and land attack missiles, or um, some even say that two of the 32 missiles were always guarded by Marines. So that is interesting. What type of missile needs to be guarded by Marines? And when we look at the ship and the modifications made to the ship in the 80s to arm her with Tomahawk cruise missiles, one of the lesser known modifications is each missile launcher area, we've got a midships missile deck and an after missile deck for Tomahawks, has one of these doors added on this little like 18 inch projection just built into the super, uh, just built into one of the smokestacks. So this one's built into the forward smokestack. On the after missile deck, there's one on each side of the aft smokestack. This structure exists solely as a phone booth for watchstanders to be able to call in an incident. What kind of watchstanders? Well, check out this video footage of Marines guarding some of the Tomahawks. If there was any sort of threat to uh, these missiles, they could come here and uh, call it in, and the Marines' quick reaction force could come and secure the area. This is probably one of the reasons why in the 1960s the Iowa-class battleship lost their marine complement, but in the 1980s it is restored. On modern ships, the only warships that have marines on them uh, are ships that carry nuclear warheads, or uh, ships that are capable of landing marines like amphibious assault craft and things like that. So, uh, there is a strong chance that our marine complement is linked to the ships being armed with nuclear weapons. There's a strong chance, based on oral histories from various sailors, that uh, they were specifically guarding just those missiles 
that were nuclear armed. And it's worth noting that other sailors at other time frames say that no, they only had uh, X number of missiles. I've also heard that the Iowa class battleships going to the Persian Gulf first uh, stopped in port to offload many of their Tomahawk missiles and replace them with exclusively the land attack version. So this may indicate just that they're offloading the sea attack version before you go into a land war. Uh, Iraq didn't have a navy that would need uh, long range anti-ship missiles uh, or it could indicate the removal of nuclear tomahawks. Whether these ships carried them or not, and the Navy will neither confirm nor deny it, the public perception of these ships is that they did. Any time Iowa-class battleships went into port, uh, especially outside of their home port, they were protested. And we've got oral histories about the ships sailing into Portland, Oregon with protesters. Uh, we've heard from Captain, uh, later Admiral Katz, who commanded the ship during her Australia cruise, that in Australia, Greenpeace was protesting the Iowa-class battleships because they were nuclear-armed. There were even stickers that were made protesting nuclear vessels that uh, they either tried to slap on the ships or that they would put in the ports around the ships to advertise that there were nuclear vessels there. And uh, they would often go out in small boats and try and uh, paint red lines on the sides of these ships or um, otherwise obstruct their ability to sail around. Further evidence that the Iowa-class battleships being nuclear-armed was in the public consciousness is the entire premise for the movie Under Siege. Tommy Lee Jones' character uh, teams up with Gary Busey's character to try and steal nuclear warheads off of an Iowa-class battleship. This movie uh, is from the early 90s, right at the end of the battleship's career, and shows that there is clearly a perception in the public consciousness that these ships were armed with or were capable of carrying nuclear warheads. And if you look at the Tomahawk launch consoles in CEC, they even have a nuclear permission to fire uh, tag with a pair of keyholes like you would expect to see. Uh, and many crew members even remember there being a red safe in the area uh, for the keys or nuclear codes or something like that. that. That varies from story to story. It may just be sailor lore because uh, we have no current evidence of a red safe on the ship. But there is clearly a perception among the crew and the public that the ships could carry and possibly did carry nuclear warheads in the 80s. While we have the most evidence for the ship being armed with nuclear warheads during the 80s, that is not the only time that Iowa-class battleships were nuclear capable. Following World War II and the development and first use of atomic warheads, there was something of a land grab between the various branches of military uh, to see who was going to be able to control this new war-ending weapon system. Uh, the Army Air Corps, which evolves into the Air Force shortly after the war, has a monopoly on the delivery systems. In those days, the B-29 Superfortress and subsequent strategic bombers. In the post-war era, there is limited funding to go around between the various branches of military. Uh, and so everybody attempts to um, design their own nuclear delivery system. For the Army, this came in the form of large artillery pieces, up to 11 inches large, that could fire a nuclear shell. The Navy saw this and thought, that's cool. Uh, so they took one of these Army warheads and modified a 16-inch shell to uh, be able to deliver it. Uh, this became known as Project Katy, or uh, the W-23 nuclear warhead and the Mark 23 projectile. The only ships in active service that could fire the Mark 23 projectile were New Jersey, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Information on this weapon is fairly sparse. We know it's developed in 1956 one year after Missouri is decommissioned. So we know that Missouri is not modified for this weapon system. Um, 
there is evidence that it was tested on New Jersey first, but many historians debate whether New Jersey ever carried it. And then it seems like Iowa and Wisconsin got more significant modifications and uh, Wisconsin even test fired one of the W-24 dummy uh, projectiles. So W-23 is the actual one. W-24 is the uh, blank test fired projectile. So it's an actual projectile, but it doesn't have a warhead in it. It's like the BLMP rounds for the uh, exploding 16 inch shells. So there is evidence that those ships were modified. In fact, outside of the female head forward of the officer's wardroom on Wisconsin, there is still a tag that references Project Katy and an alarm system that was installed for the nuclear weapons on board the ship. So we know that at least some Iowa-class battleships were modified, but was New Jersey. Uh, in our collection at the museum, we have a box of disparate blueprints relating to Project Katy uh, that don't seem to match up. For example, the uh, blueprints don't all show the same changes to the same room at the same time. Uh, they were produced over two or three years and seem to show an evolution in the design of handling techniques for Project Katy, which leads me to believe that New Jersey had one set of blueprints done to it, and then Iowa and Wisconsin had a later revision of these plans done, or possibly two later revisions, and as these ships came into the yard and got the modifications made, they get uh, increasingly more uh, security measures. So, uh, most sources that you can find today agree that the Iowa-class battleships could carry 10 of these projectiles. 50 were manufactured. Uh, they're manufactured around 1956, and they're taken out of the inventory in 1961 or 1962, which means that by 1968, when New Jersey's reactivated for Vietnam, she does not deploy with nuclear warheads, and um, so that means that obviously the 1940s she doesn't carry nuclear warheads, they haven't been developed yet, although some sailors erroneously say that they carried the atomic bomb when she left uh, Puget Sound for her yard period to go across the Pacific. Um, there's no evidence to support this. We know that Indianapolis carried the bomb over. Um, it's just a couple of enlisted men who um, in their 80s seem to be mistaking things. So there's no evidence that we carried any sort of nuclear warheads in the 40s. It would have been very difficult. Uh, there is evidence in the 50s. There's no evidence in the 60s. And there's evidence in the 80s. Anyway, um, Iowa-class battleships can each carry 10 of these warheads and 10 blanks to train with. And uh, then there's 50 in the inventory, which means that, hey, you've got one set for each of the four hour class battleships and then another full set in reserve uh, for if you expend some. That's a pretty reasonable number to have there. Carrying 10 of these, however, seems unreasonable. Before we get into what I think the doctrine was for it, let me show you some of the evidence here in the room. We are in one of the smaller 16-inch powder magazines associated with Turret 2. All of the uh, historical sources that you seem to find, like uh, Summerall's book or things you can find available on the web, seem to say that Turret 2 was the only one modified to hold these shells. Turret 2 uh, is one story taller than the other two turrets, so it's got extra room. And they seem to indicate that some sort of cage and workbench were installed in there. And sure enough, in turret two, there are mounting points in the wall that seem to indicate that there was something there that didn't show up in the other turrets. Likewise, this powder magazine associated with turret two has similar mounting points. 
we are in 468-1M, or as it would have been known in the 50s, A419M. This space is on the starboard side of the ship, fourth deck, um, outside of turret two. It's forward of turret two and aft of turret one. And in this space, we see a number of brackets like this one up here and other things down here that have been cut away and uh, even more built up. Over here, you can see a series of I-beams that have uh, bolt holes drilled into them with brackets and other things above them. None of the other magazines on the ship, none of the other magazines have anything like this. This is one of the smaller magazines associated with turret two. And this one is just feeding powder down to a lower magazine through this hoist. So losing this magazine likely uh, was not a huge impact on the ship's ability to carry enough ammunition for sustained combat. Now, all of the magazines have their fittings bolted to the deck, uh, which implies that you can unbolt all this stuff and remove it. Likewise, the brackets down here for holding the powder also bolted down, the rails bolted down. So this space can be emptied out of all of its magazine features. However, it still has the big magazine style padlock on the door. So it does make an ideal space for storing this. It's worth noting that the projectiles were not stored live and intact. We believe that this magazine is where the warheads were stored, sometimes called the squibs. So the 10, if the secondary sources are to be believed, warheads are stored in here, probably in components. And the various fastening points I showed you are for shelves and workbenches for putting those together. Once it is together, it can be moved down uh, because there's no way to pass into the armored bar, but directly from here, it has to go down a level into turret two and then be hoisted up to where the shells are. Uh, the other area with shelving seems to be the lower shell deck, although some of the blueprints seem to show a cage and maybe other fittings on the mezzanine deck. Uh, I have not been able to find any solid evidence of this on the ship. Um, but you move it up to where the shells are stored and then there is another workbench there in the turret where you can assemble the shell. The warhead goes into the shell body, the nose cone or the base, I'm not quite sure which end of the shell this is going in, goes into it uh, and then the, uh, the fuse or whatever is going to set this off and detonate it goes into it. These are low yield, just in a couple of kiloton range, air burst munitions. So they will explode in the air over a target, a city, a fleet, whatever it is that uh, you happen to be shooting at. Um, so that's how we believe that this system works. Now, carrying 10 of them, while most of the sources say that only one turret was modified, some of the blueprints we have seem to indicate that in later iterations of this design, probably post New Jersey, um, all of the turrets could have been modified. To me, the reason you would carry 10 uh, warheads is because you have nine barrels. And so this makes a tremendous first strike capability. Um, the blast radius of one of these low yield projectiles is about 20 miles. The range of one of these projectiles is about 20 miles. While New Jersey is 
hardened against NBC warfare, nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare. And we saw during the Bikini Atoll tests that battleships do not easily succumb to nuclear warheads. Um, there is a strong chance that the use of nuclear weapons by these ships from artillery was a one-time thing, uh, which means that you're not going to be firing all 10 projectiles through one turret or destroying one city and then moving to another one. So to me, that leads me to believe that you're going to try and fire a full nine gun nuclear broadside and just wipe out whatever target it is that you're shooting for in one go and probably lose the ship as a result. 10 and not nine, so that you've got some amount of redundancy if assembly of one of the squibs or something else fails or you have some sort of misfire or something else like that, you've got a backup. Um, why else would you need that many training rounds and that many live rounds firing nuclear warheads? Especially when you consider that um, we are planning for a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. How many Soviet cities are near the ocean? Like, are you going to be able to sail from this Soviet city to that Soviet city to that Soviet city over the course of a day or two as your crew succumbs to radiation sickness? and bombard several of them without being destroyed by Soviet aircraft or submarines? Probably not. So that, that further leads me to believe that this was a, a one-shot uh, option. Now, until more documents are discovered or declassified, we don't know for sure, and this is just all me uh, guessing. Uh, and again, the Navy will neither confirm nor deny that they armed surface ships with nuclear weapons. Some of the strategic arms limitation treaties of the late 80s, early 90s talk about not carrying nuclear weapons on surface ships. And so it seems like around the time that the Iowa class battleships are decommissioned, surface ships lose the nuclear capability uh, if they had them. The nuclear Tomahawk cruise missiles are taken out of service. There aren't really any other comparable uh, nuclear weapons that can be carried by surface ships. And uh, at the end of the day, surface ships are much easier to detect and destroy than the SSBN nuclear submarines that provide part of this country's nuclear triad. Uh, so why put them on surface ships when you've got a tremendous asset like the Ohio class boomers? So that is my evidence and thoughts on the equipping and stowage and arming of Iowa-class battleships with nuclear weapons. Do you think the Navy ever did it? Do you think it was just propaganda that was spread around or misinformation or rumors? Um, do you think they were modified to do it but then never carried them because we weren't in wartime? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate the support you guys have given the museum, and there's a link in the description below if you'd like to continue donating to help us. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about the museum and our channel. Thanks for watching.